Praise the Lord, friends, and welcome to the broadcast. I'm so glad that you've tuned in today. We're going to go live in just a few seconds into a broadcast where I'm teaching on what we do between here and heaven. In John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus prepared his disciples for his departure. These are some of the most powerful messages in all of the scripture, so you don't want to miss it because I believe that we can be equipped to stand strong in these last days. Open your heart. Blessings. Praise the Lord. We're in John chapter 15 today. We started in John 14. And in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus was talking to his disciples just before he, is, he uh, went to the cross and was crucified, died, was resurrected, and then ascended into heaven. And so this is really what do we do between here and, he and heaven? See, a lot of people think salvation is only about heaven. But salvation is not just about heaven there's things that are right here for right here and right now, and you need to know how to live between here and there. In fact, in John 14, he began, let your heart not be troubled. Praise God. You can be at peace. You believe in God, believe also in me. So the first thing that we talked about is believing Jesus and taking authority in his name. Did you know what? Believing Jesus changes everything. My life changed when I received Jesus Christ. Amen? My life changed when I get, got a revelation of the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. You don't just to ha ex have to accept everything that comes your way. You can take authority in the name of Jesus, and you can begin to live in what God promised you to have, not only in heaven, but right here on earth. The second thing that we talked about is relying on the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper today, and we as believers need to learn how to re rely on the Holy Spirit. Then we talked about our relationship with the Word. Did you know that your relationship with God's Word determines the place that God holds in your daily life? A number of years back, there was a very large full gospel church like this, and what they did, they did kind of a survey of their people that were coming up for different prayer needs. And that they found that the people that were believing a specific scripture had twice as much result as the people who weren't believing a certain scripture. You see, your relationship with God's word determines the place that God holds in your daily life. My life changed not only when I received Jesus, when I received the Holy Spirit, but when I got a revelation that this Bible is full of promises that you can believe and you don't have to be sick and poor and defeated by the devil. Thank God my life got a lot better. Amen? We are not just here hanging on, hoping to God. We made it, but we got it. We can believe the scriptures. We can believe the promises of the word of God. That will revolutionize your life. Jesus moved in John 15 and began to talk about, I am the vine and you are the branches. We talked about abiding in the vine. And that really connects with the word of God because Jesus is the living word. And in John chapter 15, verse 7, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. How many would like to have every prayer answered? Only two requirements right here in this verse. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Now he goes on and says this in verse 8. He said, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So how do we bear fruit? We bear fruit, number one, by abiding in Jesus and letting his word abide in us. But what happens? What is the first fruit? Jesus begins to talk about that next. He begins to talk about the love of God and walking in the God kind of love. Now, the God kind of love is different than the world's kind of love. You see, the world's kind of love is based on a feeling. It's based on emotion. 
But the God kind of love is not based on a feeling. It's not based on an emotion. It's based on a decision. Romans 5, 8 says that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did you know that Jesus Christ died for us when we were making all the wrong choices, when we were doing all the wrong things, Jesus died for us. That's the God kind of love. That is love based on a decision rather than emotion. And if you want to live a victorious life, you need to make a decision as a believer that I'm going to rule my life by the love of God. I'm going to let the love of God rule my life. Let's read beginning in John chapter 15 and verse 9. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, what is his greatest commandment? Number one, it's to love God with all your heart, all, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. But number two, the commandment, and, and Jesus, when he talked about this in Mark chapter 12, I believe it's verse 30 and 31, said the second is like to it, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. John says in his epistle, if you can't love your neighbor who you do see, how can you love God who you do not see? So he says this is a commandment. He doesn't say this is optional, right? This comes with the deal, right? You need to make a decision. I'm going to live my life by the love of God. Now, again, the love of God is based on a decision. If you really want to know what the love of God looks like, a great place to read is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to verse 8. And I like to read it in the Amplified Translation. It's kind of what I call the love test. Everybody say the love test. I want to tell you, Pastor Lawson sometimes doesn't pass the love test very well. It says this in verse 7 and 8. It says this, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. Now, what that means is love will bear up under anything that comes his way. You know, the Bible talks about God's love as forbearance. In other words, God knew what we were going to be doing wrong, and he loved us anyway. How many of you got that God loved you in spite of what you did wrong? Amen. That's what we call the cross. Amen. Praise God. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. In the Amplified, it says love always believes the best in every person. I'm glad that love believes the best in every person. This is a mark of not only Christ's love for us, this is a mark of great leaders that I know in the body of Christ. Two of my mentors, Dr. Lester Sumrall and Andrew Womack, both have this trait. They build relationships with people based on their strengths. In other words, Dr. Sumrall could have two pastors together and maybe they were at odds on an issue and be completely different sides of it. And yet Dr. Sumrall would love them both because he built a relationship with them based on their strengths. That's how God loves us. God believes the best in us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, that we're accepted in the beloved. But what makes us accepted, it talks about that we are called to the praise of the glory of his grace. That term in the Greek in Ephesians 1 verse 6 says that when God sees us, he sees us through the blood of Jesus. And God sees you in your absolute full potential in his grace. And when he sees you in that potential, he sees you through the grace of God. And he deals with you based on your full potential. He sees you through the blood. Amen. He sees you through your full potential. And when you come to rest in the grace of God, you are accepted. He says accepted. The Greek word karito, it's a form of charis, grace. Amen. Accepted in the beloved. How many of you are glad that God accepted you and did not reject you? 
But that's because he sees you through Jesus and what he did for you in Jesus. So love bears all things, believes all things, loves, hope, hopes all things. The Amplified says love, hopes are, are faithless under any circumstance or condition. How many of you are glad love hopes the very best? It says love endures all things. Love will endure the God kind of. This isn't man's love. This is impossible in the natural. This is the God kind of love. And he said, love never fails. So number one, make a decision to live your life based on the love of God. It's a commandment. In fact, that commandment fulfills all of God's law. Paul says in Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he who loves his brother has fulfilled the law. Now that's not talking about debt. It's not wrong to have a loan on a house. Hallelujah. In fact, the Bible says this. The Bible says you will lend and not borrow. So if you look at that, you will lend and not borrow. What that essentially is saying, it, it's a promise to God's covenant people in the Old Testament. If it was a sin to borrow, then it would be a sin to lend. So I had three financial mentors early in my life. My dad went home to be with Jesus when I was just 17. But my three financial mentors early in my life, uh, the, all three of those men started with almost nothing, but they all borrowed money. And over the years, they managed well, they did good business, and they became very, very wealthy. Praise God. So I borrowed some money once in a while. Now, I don't like to have bad debt. I don't like to borrow money on things that depreciate. I only like to borrow money on things that appreciate. And I don't want to have borrowing as a lifestyle, but I've used it. So that's not a sin. What this is talking about, like when I was a kid, my parents moved quite a bit. So whenever I went to a new school, guess what? We had to find out who was the boss. And so we'd get in a fight, right? And then we'd say, I owe you one. Now, I may have been little, but I was feisty. Hallelujah. And my daddy told me the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Hallelujah. And so, you know what? I don't know how girls do it. I didn't raise girls. Praise God. But I'm telling you how boys do it. They, they figure out who's the boss. I remember Dr. Lester Summerall talking about when he was a kid in school. He said there was this bully and he's beating everybody. And Dr. Lester Summerall's kind of little like me. He said, so I pulled him up to the curb and I put him in the gutter and I was on the curb. And he said, I hit him right in the nose and I busted his nose and blood went running everywhere. He said, and that was the end of him bullying me around. You know, the devil is nothing but a bully. He's just a loud mouth bully. But you need to take the name of Jesus and the authority in the name of Jesus and put the devil in his place. Hallelujah. Friends, we've been teaching on what we do between here and heaven, and we have many other teachings like this. They're absolutely free of charge, downloadable audio, downloadable video, and these teachings too on our website at charischristiancenter.com. Been serving really hard, serving the Lord, running my carpet cleaning business, just going above and beyond. And I'm feeling a little fatigued. I'm healthy. I'm whole in the name of Jesus. But I just wanted to reach out. I'm feeling a little tired coming in today. But right now, my whole body feels tingling. I'm feeling good. I feel healing power running through my body right now. And uh, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. So we need, to, we need to walk in the God kind of love, and it's not an option, it's a commandment. So Jesus in this, or Paul in the scripture says, own no man anything but to love one another. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, he says, for he who loves one another, in the end of verse 8, has fulfilled the law for this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor and commit adultery with his wife. You can't love your neighbor and steal from him. You can't love your neighbor and lie about him. You can't love yourself and lie about your neighbor. You can't love yourself and steal. You can't love God and do those ungodly things. Amen? 
You see, it all begins with the love of God. So he goes on and says this, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's why love is the first commandment. In fact, in the New Testament, John talks about this in his epistle. There's really only two commandments, believe on Jesus and love one another. But again, you can't, you can't, if you walk in those and fulfill them, and it's the love of God. See, when you're born again, when you believe on Jesus, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost that's given to you. And you have the love of God in you. Now let's go back to John and continue to read. He's still talking about what happens when we walk in love. Notice if we go back to verse 11, he says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You see, love is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that God is love. Galatians 5 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. He says, against such there is no law. So God is love. It doesn't say God is any of those other things, but God is love. And joy flows from love. You don't see somebody who's full of strife towards someone really operating, right, in joy. You don't see somebody who's full of anxiety and full of strife. You don't see somebody really walking in peace. So love is the first fruit. And love, when you walk in the love of God, it produces joy. See, the Bible says this in Romans 14, 17. It says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words, it's not a bunch of religious rules. But it's righteousness, right standing with God, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so when you're born again and you learn to listen to the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, guess what? You can do what you want to do. I'm not talking about your flesh, but I'm talking about your spirit. I'm talking about the new person in Christ, the inward man that Paul talks about. Amen? So thank God we have this inward man. And when we're born again, we've got the love of God shed abroad in our heart. And all the whole fruit of the Holy Spirit are in us. We just got to learn how to walk in them. So the first one he talks about is walking in love. And love brings joy. Can you bring me a drink? Thank you so much. So as we go on and look at this, Jesus says this. He goes on. And says in verse 13, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus was a living demonstration of the love of God. And, and he says, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life. You see, love is not talking about getting our own way. Love is talking about laying down our own way. Amen? And Jesus says, lay down his life for his friends. He said, you're my friends if you do what I command you. From this point, I do not call you servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known to you. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. Now he begins to talk about friendship. Now if you really begin to understand the Bible, in the Old Testament, when we walk by God's law, it made us a servant of God. And if you understand servants, when a servant does a good job, you reward them because they've done a good job. When an employee here at the church does a good job, I try to reward them because of the good job that they've done working here at the church, right? That's an Old Testament mentality, right? Called a servant. But Jesus said, I'm not calling you a servant. I'm calling you a friend. And greater love has this, no man, than he lay down his love for his friend. Now, there's something when you begin to understand friendship. And he says, I'm calling you friends. And he says... For all things that I heard of my father, I've made known to you. You see, I could buy, say, a 2,000-acre ranch, and I might have an overall plan of what I want to do that. I want to make it a dream property. And so if I do that, I may hire someone, and I may have out there digging post holes and building a fence, and all they know about that plan is they're supposed to dig this post hole and build this fence. 
But I can drive by while they're out there working on that, and I can look at that, and I can, I can see not only that, what they're doing there, I can see the barn they're going to build. I can see the cattle that I'm going to put in the different pastures. I can see the house that I'm going to develop. I can see all these different aspects, and I can tell my friend about it because he's my friend. So when, I'm, so when my friend comes by and looks at it, my friend, guess what? My friend knows what the overall vision. He knows the dream. This is the thing about walking in love. Walking in love not only fulfills God's greatest commands. Walking in love not only brings you into joy, but walking in love will bring you into the purpose and the plan of God. And if you want to walk in the purpose and the plan of God, don't make a decision outside of the love of God. Let the love of God rule your life. But you see, it doesn't only end with servanthood and friendship. Paul writes about this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through verse 7. And Paul says in that portion of Scripture that we are no more servants, but we are sons. We are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And when you're the children of God, you have the Spirit of God in you. Amen. And the spirit of God leads you into the purposes and the plans of God. See, Jesus says, you have not chosen me. This wasn't your deal. This was my deal. I chose you. And I ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. God wants us to bring forth fruit. And he says, when you're operating in the plan of God and you want your fruit to remain, what do you do? You take authority again in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus helps you live out the plans and the purposes of God in this earth. Praise the Lord. So when you walk in the love of God, that fulfills God's highest command. Love, the Bible says in Colossians 3 verse 14, put on charity, put on the God kind of love. See, it's charity. It's something you didn't earn. It's something you didn't deserve. Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or the bond of maturity. I can't tell how mature you are by how much you operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell how mature you are by how much you give. But I can tell how mature you are by how well you walk in the love of God. Amen. That is the bond of Christian maturity. Amen? And so the fruit of the Spirit show us true Christian maturity. We not, need not only the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the first of which is the God kind of love. Amen? So let the love of God rule your life. So you've got to get your identity from Jesus rather than the world. In fact, Paul writes about this in Galatians 6, 14, and he said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me. The world's not motivating me, compelling me. And he says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm dead to the world. Now that's easier said than done. But that's what he's talking about. And when you get your identity in Christ and his cross, you don't care so much what the world thinks about you. In fact, John writes this in his epistle in 1 John 2, verse 15 to verse 17. Love not the world, for everything in the world is lust of the eye and lust of the uh, uh, pride of life. What, what's he say? It's, it's, it's lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it's not of the Father, but of me. And if any man love the world, then their love of the Father's not in them. And we preach about that a lot. But however, before that, in verse 12 through verse 15 of 1 John chapter 2, he says five things that we have as believers. He says, I'm writing unto you because you are forgiven. I'm writing unto you because you have a relationship with God. You've known him that's from the beginning. I'm writing you to you because you are strong. I'm writing to you because the word of God abides in you. I'm writing unto you because you have overcome the wicked one. And guess what? When you understand that you are forgiven, you have a relationship with God. You are strong. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. The world, the flesh, and the devil are not a big problem for you anymore. So you've got to get an identity in Jesus and in, and in Christ, and then the world doesn't have such a pull, such an effect on you. And that's what he's really talking about here. 
Thanks so much, friends, for being with us today. We've been sharing on what to do from here to heaven. Number one, you need to believe on Jesus or you won't make heaven. But number two, you need to learn the power of our authority as believers in the name of Jesus. If you need prayer today, we have prayer ministers that know how to take their authority in the name of Jesus. So give us a call today at the church. And we have many great teachings like this free of charge on our website at charischristiancenter.com. In his final moments before the cross, Jesus shared a powerful message found in John 14, 15, and 16, offering guidance for living with purpose on the earth. From here to there is a message essential for every believer to live with intention and faith until we join him in heaven. Get your copy today of Pastor Lawson's teaching entitled From Here to There, a $25 value free of charge when you download it today at Karis Christian Center. Praise the Lord, friends. I want to invite you to church this coming Sunday morning. Whether you're in Colorado Springs or whether you're wherever you're at, if you're in Colorado Springs, you can see us Sunday morning at 8.30 or 10.30 a.m. live, but you can also watch us with our live stream congregation at 8.30 or 10.30 a.m., or you can go to our website and get it anytime at charischristiancenter.com.